members of the Oshkosh community, the sophomores at Oshkosh West High School want to invite you to our community night at Beckett's. Each year the sophomores are tasked to come up with an idea where spreading to positively change their world. At community night we work to showcase these ideas so that you can see all of the great things our kids are doing to better the Oshkosh community and the larger world as a whole. Please join us Wednesday, May 31st at the Beckett's Atrium from 6 until 8.30 p.m. to check out our students' project. We look forward to seeing you and hope you can come and support Oshkosh education. Hi, I'm Father Bob Miller. I'm giving the talk tonight at the Milwaukee Civil War Roundtable called Faith of the Fathers. We're going to be talking about the faith of the Catholic chaplains during the Civil War today. And I'm looking forward to the presentation. I've been here a number of times. It's based on and spins off of theories in the book that I wrote about religion and the Civil War called Both Prayed to the Same God. Uh, there's very few books written entirely on the role of religion and faith in the Civil War. My book is one of the few about that. Uh, I was very privileged to have James McPherson do the foreword for this book. Uh, Jim really liked the book and was happy to do a foreword for it. It's really unique in the Civil War studies. Nothing else out there on religion and faith before, during, and after the war. Tonight's topic will be a little further spinning off of that about the Catholic chaplains. This is actually preparation for the next book I'm going to write uh, about the Catholic priests in the Civil War. I've also authored a couple of other books uh, not related to the Civil War. I'm a pastor, a Catholic priest, and I've written three books that help people understand the scriptures, to help their meditation, help in their reflection. Uh, these are books called the Lectio Divina series, uh, one for each of the three years of the scriptures of, that we use in our Sunday services. They're great for simple everyday meditations, it's great for tying in with Sunday worship to give you some meat to reflect on to get ready for worship. So uh, as always, the books are available from me directly, robertjmiller.net at my website, or or you can always go to Amazon.com. The books are available there as well. Uh, I'd certainly like to have you read them. My publisher would love to have you read them. But please, uh, help support it as best you can. God bless you. Good evening, everyone. Joining us for the third time, as we believe, is uh, Reverend Robert Miller, Father Bob, an active priest from the south side of Chicago, former president of the Chicago Civil War Roundtable and under Cuthbert He's going to speak tonight on the role of some 90 Catholic chaplains in the Civil War. He's got some books. He's written about six or some of them on the site. We'll sell later. But tonight is going to be uh, Faith of the Fathers. <laughs> Good evening, everybody. It's good to be here again. Um, last time I was here, um, uh, last time I was not here, I want to thank you. <laughs> My last time here was a very popular speech. Um, I didn't show up, <laughs> and many of you didn't either, because it was, what, January? A year and a half ago, and it was blizzard time. So I'm sure glad you uh, put it this, this one in May to make it happen a little bit. What a fine young presentation that was by that young man, wasn't it? Just a great job, thank you. Makes you feel that our country's in great hands with young people like that sharing good things tonight. So, um, there's an a ad campaign that um, kind of went viral about uh, five years ago about an alcoholic root beer. Uh, in Wakanda it was made. You may have heard about it before, Not Your Father's Root Beer. Remember hearing about that? Well, um, I want to steal a page from those ad people and say that you could probably call my presentation Not Your Father's Priests. Um, this, this is titled Faith of the Fathers, but uh, there is nothing boring about these guys. These are not your normal, ordinary, churchy, uh, ethereal priests. Um, there's about a hundred or so of them that I've come up with. They were a unique breed of people, uh, literally just as much pioneers. As, as the settlers were, and as uh, the pilgrims who came to this country a long time ago. Uh, they were adventuresome, they were strong, adaptable, uh, uh, courageous, outspoken people, and literally they brought good news to a foreign land too. They were Catholics coming into a Protestant country. So it was quite an amazing accomplishment. So tonight we're going to talk about faith 
of the fathers. I want to thank my friend Steve for uh, being my uh, assistant here, moving it forward. So we're going to kick over to the first slide. Let's get started here with just setting some terms. When you talk about chaplains, um, let's just get some background here first of all. Where does the term come from? Well, the term chaplain actually comes from the Latin word kappa. Uh, it's, it's, the legend has it connected to a Saint Martin of Tours. Uh, you know your old Catholic history, he was a Roman soldier. Supposedly he met a beggar on the road who needed help and he cut the cape in half and gave it to him and that night Jesus appeared to him wearing that half of the cape. So that's the legend that that's where the story started from. Kappa becomes the French word, becomes the English word for a chaplain. Um, there were chaplains in uh, England, France, Italy, but we're not going to go into that. That's not the point of it through 16th, 17th, 18th century. Our history in America starts with the Rev War, 1776 in there. George Washington uh, felt the need for chaplains. He issued an order early on saying, quote, the blessing and protection of heaven is at all times necessary, but especially in times of public distress. So a chaplain is allowed to each regiment. In 1777, that was confirmed, and one priest served among the other chaplains who were in the Rev War. When the war ended, uh, the size of the army was cut back, and they eliminated the positions of several, several positions, including chaplain. So there's only one chaplain left on active duty who was serving at West Point. Mech War of Mexico, 1846 broke out. There was 13 chaplains, but this is different. They did not travel with the troops. They stayed at the posts where they were. Two of those chaplains were Catholic priests. They were Jesuits. Trust me, you will hear the word Jesuit again in this presentation. Uh, and of course, when the Civil War came out, that was the big uh, turning point for chaplains in the uh, military of the United States. When the war broke out, both North and South felt the need for chaplains. The uh, Secretary of War, Leroy Walker from the Confederacy, called for chaplains in April of 1861. Next month, uh, Congressman Francis Barlow had a bill passed. It never mandated uniforms, which is why, if you ever do any looking, uh, Confederate chaplains wore anything under the sun. <laughs> uh, a lot of times they did settle for the chaplains the uh, captain's uniform, which was the standard rank for chaplains during the war, tended to be the Confederate uniform. They had no duties specified. Salaries were specified originally at $85 a month. And you can tell the government was involved because two months later it was cut to $50. Uh, and then the Union side, flip over Steve, the next one. The Union side, uh, the, the chaplaincy was established by General Orders 15 and 16. May 4th, 1861. The orders provided for, Catholic, for Christian chaplains to be chosen by officers, chosen by the field officers and the company commanders. Um, the pay originally went up and down. Finally, it was settled at $100 a month, 1862. Uh, Congress did lay out a basic uniform for the chaplains, and you see it in the top corner with Louis Beaudry, uh, who wrote a nice journal. Uh, Fifth New York Cavalry, you can see it's a standard black frock coat, nine buttons down the front. Uh, there was no cross insignias. You will occasionally see some at stores. They're not authentic, okay? They didn't come in until after the war was done. Uh, but the buttons are authentic, and that was pretty much the uniform. There you see a Confederate chaplain. You can see he's wearing the traditional gray that a lot of chaplains wore in the Confederacy. Um, the wording of the 1861 orders were later changed. Uh, because the Jewish folk raised a little stink about there was a no, you know, the chaplains were originally supposed to be Christian. And that was changed to allow, uh, as it says, quote, chaplains from any religious denomination to be appointed. So how many chaplains in all, all together? Roughly 2,400 for the North, which is a misleading number, because at any one time, there's never more than 600 in service at one time. Uh, in the Confederate, uh, 938 recognized denominational chaplains, but a lot more had commissions. Um, we won't get into the, to the Baptists, but the Baptists don't quite have an ordained ministry, so some guys floated in and out of uh, chaplaincy positions, so they had up to 1,300, which was actually 14% of all Southern clergy at the time. So denominational breakdown, you see it down there, identical patterns really uh, pretty much mirrors America, uh, Methodist, Presbyterians, Baptist. However, actually uh, Methodists were the largest group in the country at the time, followed by the Baptists, uh, so the statistics don't quite match that. 
Now, let's just kick over to being a Catholic chaplain. What makes a Catholic chaplain? It's a little more tricky question than you might think. Uh, there's two books about Catholic chaplains, and uh, I'm going to be writing one. Oh, if I can ever, if the Cardinal ever lets me retire uh, from Chicago, I'm going to write a book on the Catholic priest chaplains. The last two were written were back in 1940. So I redid the terms of how you define, because our research is much better now, and there's much more information out. So Steve, flip over to the next slide, and uh, here we go, defining, here's the terms that I've come to use to define a Catholic chaplain. Official or unofficial, full-time or part-time. I define official as being recognized by some legitimate authority, either the state or the national service, and at least three months service. That makes you official. Uh, unofficial, you might be working in a parish, a religious house, and short time work in a, in, a, in, a, in a ministry with the troops, but nothing more than that. Of course, there are many other priests who came and went. They were occasional chaplains. Full-time meant, here's how I define it, some formal enrolling or mustering in. Just like soldiers, they have to be formally mustered in and enrolled in. And number two, full-time, I designate three years of sustained military service. That doesn't sound like much, but you gotta remember, the situation with priests was very different in the Civil War. Priests were nearly always, in fact, almost to a person, they were older than all the troops by far because of the seminary training. You, you couldn't even get ordained till you were 25 or 26. If you were a Jesuit, you didn't get ordained till you were 33 because of the, the years of training that they had. Number two, priests are not exactly used to manual labor outdoors, are they? So this, this outdoor work, outdoor lifestyle was a tough one for priests to have to get used to in the camp life. And then lastly, be polite and say they were used to a lot more comfortable living circumstances <laughs> than tents. So uh, three years, we'll see that in a second. Those are how I define that. Now how long a priest served um, really is not always determined by the military. Uh, remember, priests are under authority, aren't they? So sometimes the military, their terms are in, but most of the time they had to get permission from their superior. And the superior many times would call them back, and we'll be talking more about that. So with, with immigrants pouring into the country, a lot of priests just couldn't serve very long periods of time. Some interesting exceptions, there's a guy who you'll see a little later on, John Bannon, uh, he's not on this picture. John Bannon was a priest in St. Louis, he worked in the cathedral. He supported the Confederacy. He wanted to work with the 1st Missouri Infantry. He knew the bishop wouldn't let him do it. So what did he do? Being the obedient priest, he wrote a letter to the bishop, put it on his desk, and walked out the door. <laughs> and so he went anyway and served the troops. Now, there are three places that Catholic chaplains served. It's the same thing in Protestant as well. Either a hospital, or a post, or a regiment. There was about 17 gentlemen that were hospital chaplains. Uh, only five were post chaplains, the great majority were regimental chaplains. So, putting all that together, how many do we have? I count 104 official or unofficial, full-time, part-time chaplains. 63 are Union, 41 Confederate, Irish predominated. 53% of them were Irish. Uh, French were 16, German were 5%. 74 were official. Now, 50, 33 were religious, 57 diocesan. Here's the key, and we'll talk more about this. Of all those guys, how many do you think were full-time? 15. Only 15 guys served three years or more. Well, you'll see why as time goes by. Okay, I've got the facts out of the way. I didn't want this presentation to be all about facts. I'm a storyteller. So I wanted to get the facts out of the way and just tell some stories and narrate about the guys who served. So first distinction I need to make before I kick over the next slide, and I need to ask you all, I know you got Marquette grads here, can you tell me the difference between a diocesan priest and a religious order priest? I know we got Deacon Dean over there. Dean, tell everybody, what's the difference?
they're not tied to a specific diocese. Key point. That's the key point. They're all over the world. Yeah, and that's going to be the key point here. Um, so you have to understand. So when you start talking about uh, who the full-time chaplains were, it's not going to be a surprise. The majority of them are religious. So now we have, uh, the, the, we have two major groups, religious orders, that supplied what I affectionately call the studs <laughs> of Catholic chaplains. Because there were some guys that were just amazing. And one of the orders is not too far from here. Kick it over, Steve. What's that little college in Indiana whose name I constantly forget? Notre Dame. Notre Dame uh, provided eight chaplains. Um, Notre Dame, of course, began in 1842 in the wilds of Indiana. It was a French boarding school, uh, <laughs> primary school, prep school. It attracted such prominent people as the children of William Tecumseh Sherman were at Notre Dame. Remember his wife, Ellie, very, very strong Catholic. Okay? Sherman's memorabilia are this day at Notre Dame because of Ellie's strong connection there. Notre Dame had 213 students, 13 priests in 1861, and Father Soren, you see him in the lower left-hand corner, is the founder. Uh, Sister Angela Gillespie deserves a whole talk unto herself. Her nuns were served on the river, Red River, Red Rover, on the Mississippi River as nurses. But Soren gave seven priests, two died during the War of Disease. One, Father Dillon, will die three years after the war from disease he picked up during the war. This is the same problem that you know about the troops, isn't it? We all know that two for one died because of disease. Same problem with the priest. Fascinating little vignette picture on the, on the right side, isn't it? About these priests here. You got Father Paul Gillen, top left-hand corner, one of the oldest chaplains. Uh, he came uh, to serve, and he did not want to serve in a regiment, didn't want to be tied down. He rigged up a contraption that was like a buggy. He slept in it, he ate in it, he did mass in it. And he drove from regiment to regiment uh, in the East Coast until Grant, General Grant got very upset about it and, and banned it. And he had to plug in, so he plugged in with an Irish regiment later on. Across the way, you see in the top right-hand corner, Father Kilroy, chaplain for about a minute. And then he ended up leaving the Holy Cross and joining the diocese. Um, in the lower left-hand corner, uh, an evil sheep has crept in. That is not a... Uh, Holy Cross, that is a Jesuit. <laughs> I don't know how he snuck in this picture, but that's Father Ouellette. We'll hear about him in a minute. Bottom is Father Dillon, who uh, actually started the chaplains in Notre Dame. In the far corner, Laura, is Father Carrier, who was a three-month chaplain in Vicksburg and only went there because Ellie Sherman complained that her brothers, who were Catholics, had no priest. So she went to Soren and said, you need to send somebody. And he said, yes, ma'am. And he sent Father Carrier for three months to minister down there. Now, so those are some of the ones, but the stud, if you don't mind my word, of all Catholic chaplains, we have to give him a whole slide. Next one over. This is the man, if you've heard of any chaplains, you've heard of this guy, Corby. Father William Corby, most well-known of all the Catholic chaplains. 88th New York, part of the Irish Brigade, famed for his long service and his Gettysburg General Absolution. You see the two pictures on the right. He's very famous for the second day of Gettysburg Absolution. You know the story. You know that? Irish Brigade's about ready to get sent in. Uh, the middle of the line. Remember Sickles moved his line out and they were getting shot up. And so they sent the Irish Brigade and they knew they were going to get killed very heavily. So uh, Corby stood on a rock, gave a picture, a general uh, gave an absolution to all the troops. Then they went off and fought in the field. He's very famous for that. Actually, we'll see in a moment. He's not the only one who did a general absolution. It was done pretty frequently. He was one of the rare priest chaplains who was born in the United States, born in Detroit. Uh, he went to Notre Dame when he was 10, and Soren saw something in this guy. They said, this guy is going up the ladder. He grabbed him, trained him, worked with him, and uh, he spent three years with the 88th New York, wrote a marvelous diary, the second best Catholic diary. I'll mention the first in a minute. Memoirs of a Chaplain's Life. Just tremendous. Uh, he later on became a president of Notre Dame twice. Uh, his memoirs put him on the map, but you know, it doesn't hurt to have someone who really likes you doing PR. Um, somebody's doing a Medal of Honor presentation. Uh, one of the Irish Brigade officers, St. Clair Mulholland, wanted Corby nominated for a Medal of Honor. And he pushed him for a Medal of Honor. 
But as I understand it, and maybe you know different, only soldiers can receive medals of honor. Corby was not allowed a medal of honor. So what did Mulholland do? He went ahead and built, had built the only statue to a chaplain anywhere on any Civil War battlefield. Guess who's got it? Corby. And it looks exactly like that top picture there on the right side. A clone of it is at Notre Dame. I used to touch the statue every day when I lived at Notre Dame for six months writing my Civil War book. He has his hand up in the air. Being Notre Dame, you know they have given that statue a nickname. Does everybody here know what Notre Dame affectionately calls the statue of Father Corby with his hand up? Fair Catch Corby. <laughs> it's now known as Fair Catch Corby. Amazing, amazing gentleman. So he got a statue. Next slide. The second stud of the CSC, this is Ed Barr's favorite chaplain. If you ever go on a tour with Ed Barr, she'll tell you about Peter Paul Cooney. Great chaplain, amazing man. <laughs> I love Cooney. He always oh, he raves about Peter Paul Cooney. Uh, he is the longest serving Catholic chaplain in the entire war. Uh, 18, October 1861 to July 1865, and so consecutively. He tried to leave in 1864 because his health was getting weaker and his order was calling him back. The soldiers were in tears, literally in tears. The officers signed a petition. The general got involved and said it would be a calamity, so he never left. Consecutive service, the only one really to spend that kind of time. He was an Irishman, immigrant, was a school teacher before he joined the order, ordained 59, 1859. He volunteered to work with Indiana troops. 35th Indiana. Uh, when the 35th was formed, the first year was pretty boring. Spent a lot of quiet time down in Kentucky and uh, Tennessee. But all of a sudden, they uh, got, became part of the Army of the Cumberland and stumbled into a little place called Stones River. And after that, it's all history. Stones River, Chickamauga, Lookout Mountain, Kennesaw Mountain, Perryville, Atlanta Campaign. He was at them all. And just a tremendous man. Uh, a little cantankerous, they say. Um, he could be a little feisty at times. He liked order and discipline, liked to lecture people, but he was completely courageous and brave. Let me read you a, an anecdote. At Stones River was his first battle experience. His commander, Colonel Mullen, when he wrote his official report, actually wrote about the chaplain. And very few times was that done in the actual official report. Here's what he wrote. Quote, to Father Cooney, our chaplain, too much praise cannot be given, indifferent as to himself. He was deeply solicitous for the temporal and spiritual welfare. On the field, he was cool, indifferent to danger. In the name of the regiment, I thank him for his kindness and his laborious attention to the dead and to the dying. Uh, Cooney also had a uh, fascinating custom, by the way. Uh, when the soldiers would get paid, um, they wanted to send their money back home. Well, if you're stuck in the middle of Tennessee at Stones River, how's the money going to get back home? Cooney would collect the money. Now, just think about the trust that they had in him. The soldiers would give him their money. He would ride back to Indiana with the money and give it to their parents or put it in the post office. They tell a story that one time the money amounted to $24,000 he was carrying in the saddlebags. And he says in his, his letter, says, I never carried a revolver except that day <laughs> on his way back. Marvelous picture, isn't that? Uh, original picture of Atlanta campaign. Look at the small vignettes. There's Cooney at Stones River and a marvelous picture of uh, him getting ready to say mass. And there's Cooney in the middle looking like his cantankerous little self over there. Uh, Ed Barr's favorite chaplain. So those are the men of Notre Dame. Uh, they are the original fighting Irish. <laughs> and the Irish did love to fight, as we'll talk about. When I worked at Notre Dame doing my book, I went out to the cemetery of the five guys who fought, four of them are buried behind Notre Dame today. So you can still go there and, and see their graves today. Now let's turn to the most influential religious order of priest in the entire war, in the country, in the world. Who do you think they are? Let me give you a hint, the Pope is one. <laughs> Jesuits. And you knew I was gonna talk about the Jesuits in here someplace. Loud and proud, baby, God's stormtroops. Uh, I have a whole, whole talk I do on the Jesuits. Just amazing group. Many of you know that already. The largest contingent of Catholic chaplains, 16 in all. Only 10 were official. Truly amazing history. We don't have time to go into it. Founded by Ignatius Loyola 
in reaction to the Reformation. They were founded clearly uh, to be <laughs> devoted to the Pope in the post-Reformation days. Number two, educated men. And to this very day, you all, I don't have to tell you about that, right? You got that little place next to this place called Marquette. That's full. Jesuits are all over the place with education. And lastly, they're missionaries. They go anywhere. Folks, I want to tell you how funny this is. This is a sidebar. I just came back from a two-week cruise through the Panama Canal. We wound up at Cabo San Lucas. We didn't stay in Cabo. We took a bus to a little village, San Jose. Nothing there except the church. Walk into the church. Guess who founded the church? Jesuits. That's typical of how powerful they were. A very educated group, caused a lot of controversy. Don't have time to go into it. Look at Lincoln's quote about the Jesuits. Look at John Adams' quote about them. They were actually banned in Europe for a while because their politics were so, uh, so rough at the time. Amazing guys. Look at the trivia. I, I don't have time to go through it all. One of the most amazing pieces of trivia, a Jesuit was at every single major Civil War battle. Just incredible. It took me about five years to come to that realization. But just incredible deals. Uh, a few of these guys, uh, Michael Nash, 6th New York, worked with the Zouaves in Florida, one of the roughest groups in the Army, Billy Wilson Zouave from New York City. Louis Hippolyte Gachet was a Frenchman with Lee's Army of Northern Virginia. He was the longest serving Confederate chaplain. He wrote a lot of letters. He was very outspoken. Thomas Ouellette, the man who snuck into the, the Notre Dame picture, he was an Irish Brigade. And he actually served in the Regiment 69th Irish Brigade twice. And then in between, he still needed more work, so he went to South Carolina and worked in a hospital. Very dedicated man, uh, Irish, heavily mentioned. And then the last man, Joseph Prochinsky, uh, was a, a, a German man who loved dressing up. Captain wasn't enough for him. He used to go around calling himself Major. And his Jesuit conference had a lot of fun with that. They had a lot of fun poking fun. Now let's talk. Next slide about the stud of the Jesuits, one of my favorite guys, Joseph O. Hagen. An amazing gentleman, a native Irishman, um, ordained 1861. Um, I've spoken here before. I've probably told this story before, but it's funny. I'll tell it again. When O'Hagan was elected, remember, it was elected by the officers. Here's how he describes his election to the 73rd uh, New York, which was called the Excelsior Brigade. Quote, over 400 voted for a Catholic priest. 150 more voted for any kind of Protestant. 11 voted for a Mormon elder. 335 said they could find their way to hell without the assistance of clergy. So, <laughs> One of the great stories. Uh, 73rd New York was an amazing group of men. I won't read the whole description because my presentation is a little long. But here's what O'Hagan said at one point, quote, such a collection of men was never united before since Noah's flood. Most of them were the scum of New York society, reeking with vice and spreading moral malaria around them. <laughs> he uh, grew to be very fond of them, though. His first impressions were not very positive. Funny anecdotes, he got captured. Priest got captured too. And he got captured at Malvern Hill with two other priests. And it makes sense. They were ministering to the troops uh, during the advance and they got captured. Uh, instead of being held in prison camps, they were sent to the Bishop of Richmond's house, Bishop McGill. Can you imagine having three northern chaplains in the house of a southern bishop? And there's some cute stories about some interesting quote unquote discussions they had at night, so they're kind of held there for three weeks before they were gone. He became friends with that gentleman in the lower middle there, Joseph Twitchell, who was a Congregationalist minister. They ministered in the same brigade. Um, and they became very good friends, maybe because after the Battle of Fredericksburg, a very interesting incident happened. If you remember Fredericksburg, it was the winter time. Uh, when the battle was done, it was freezing. You all know the story. The troops were laying on the battlefield. It was freezing. O'Hagan and Twitchell had been ministering to the troops. They finally went underneath the tree to fall asleep, and it was freezing. So they said, we, we're freezing to death out here. We've got to do something. Let's put our blankets together. So they spooned underneath the blankets together, and finally one of them was laughing. The other said, what are you laughing about? He says, about this horrible state of things? He says, no, I'm just laughing about the two of us. A Catholic priest and a Congregationalist Calvinist minister spooning under a blanket together. I wonder what God would think. And the other guy said, I think he would like it. They became very, very good friends long after the war as well. Um, interesting little tidbit. 
He was with uh, the Excelsior Brigade. If you know your Civil War history, you know that was General Dan Sickles. And what did Dan Sickles do at Gettysburg, second day? Moved out. Guess who gave him anointing of the sick when he lost his leg? Right here. O'Hagan is the one who went up and gave anointing to General Dan Sickles as he puffed on his cigar and headed out the door. He also did a general absolution of the troops, and he became a future president of Holy Cross College. Great little anecdote about him going on. Uh, the last day of the war, he was with the troop at Appomattox, with the Union troops, and he's watching the Confederates filing in. As the Confederates are filing in, he looks, and here's a Louisiana brigade, and guess who's in line? One of his Jesuit converts. Father Hippolyte Gachet, who they had lived with, had not seen each other for five years. They met at Appomattox, and they together walked back to the Georgetown house together. A great story. So two other gentlemen in here I want to just mention, then we'll get off the Jesuits. The man in the top, I could do another whole talk on him, Joseph Bixio, what a man. Um, trickster is the only word I can think of. A Joseph Bixio, Jesuit priest, had a habit of sneaking across lines, impersonating chaplains. And he, impersonated, he stole across the Union lines in 1864, stole the credentials of the portly gentleman, <laughs> Father Leo Rizza, a, a Franciscan. He stole his credentials as a chaplain, went and got four wagon loads of supplies, and took them south in the Confederate lines. Well, when the Union generals found out about this, they were not happy campers, and they would look out and Phil Sheridan, who was in charge, would find the first Confederate priest he could find. And I'll let you know who that is in one second. Bixio got off scot-free. Fascinating story. The man down below, Bernadine Widget, was a man from Switzerland. He left the Europe when the Jesuits were banned, and he was a very close friend of the Surratt family. He gave first communion to Mary Surratt's daughter. Her husband was a drunk, and they had no money. So she went to Widget and said, can you help my kids get into a school? So he personally got John Surratt and Isaac Surratt into a Catholic school in 1854. When, um, Mary, when she was put on trial, he was a character witness for her. When she was condemned, he heard her last confession. And he was the last, one of the last persons that walked to the gallows with her. By the way, this is an extremely rare <coughs> picture of Mary Surratt. Uh, we have very few pictures of her. This is only two. And this is one picture of Mary Surratt. The only other one is the one that she's hanging from the gallows. So have you had enough Jesuits for a while? OK, let's flip over to the next one. There's a few other notable chaplains I don't have time to talk about. But let me just mention a few. I mentioned that somebody got in trouble for Bixio. It's the guy in the lower left-hand corner, my buddy, Father James Sheeran. Um, I actually uh, portray him and reenact him in Civil War reenactments. Sheeran was a tough cookie in himself, but he spent five months in jail paying the price because they thought he was the one who did it. And uh, Phil Sheridan was supposed to be a Catholic, so it, it did not go well. Um, Sheeran actually was a fascinating story. He was a married man. Wife died. His son died, and he became a priest. Wound up in New Orleans, wound up serving in the 14th Louisiana with Robert E. Lee. And he became personal friends with Robert E. Lee, Stonewall Jackson. This is an amazing, amazing character. Right above him, you see Father Hippolyte Gachet. He's the one O'Hagan meant when he walked in on Appomattox. Lower right-hand corner, there's our buddy Ouellette again, the one who keeps slipping into the Notre Dame picture. Uh, and right above is a, a sketch from Corby's memoirs about Ouellette and Corby on a horse. Horses just got panicked by an artillery shell flying away. Down in the middle, you do have two diocesan priest. You have uh, John Bannon. Remember I told you the guy in St. Louis who left a letter on the desk for the bishop and walked out? That's him. He became a chaplain of the Missouri troops all the way up to Gettysburg, excuse me, Vicksburg. When the Confederates surrendered at Vicksburg, he found his way to Richmond. Richmond said, we're going to send you as an envoy to the Vatican to try to convince the Vatican to support the Confederate cause. He did. Of course, you know, nothing came out of it. He wound up going to England, and you want to take one guess which religious order he wound up joining? Jesuits. He wound up a Jesuit at the end of his life. And Father Brady, 15th Michigan, served a long time, a great man, never got sick during the war, but he died of exposure on the way home from the war, sadly speaking. 
Great picture, I love that one in the middle. That's a real life picture from the Civil War of a priest, Father Scully, saying mass for the 9th Massachusetts, getting ready to either say mass or finishing mass. It's a great picture. You'll often see that one on the internet in different places, okay? Now let's shift gears a little bit. Um, let's, we've talked about well-educated priests, individuals. Let's go to some places where there are chaplains. Let's go to rare places. Let's go south and go west where there weren't many Catholics and there certainly were not many priests. Um, biggest city in the Confederacy. Who knows what it is? Biggest city in the Confederacy? By far, New Orleans. Okay, 168,000. Second biggest, Charleston, 40,000. Richmond was after that with 37. New Orleans, full of Catholics. This very day, it's got that French culture. So a lot of the Louisiana troops, we'll see that in a second, came from Louisiana. A lot of the chaplains came from Louisiana. But once you're outside Louisiana, <laughs> it is thin pickings. And the story of the Catholic Church can really easily be described. No priests, no church, no money. And that's the problem. We want to talk about two fascinating places where somehow amazing bishops made it work. I want to go to two trans-Mississippi theaters and talk about two. Let's go to the most westernmost theater of the war. First of all, Steve, flip it over. New Mexico Territory. Uh, let's just refresh our history. Arizona did not become a state until 1863. So this is all one territory controlled by one diocese here. The Civil War story here, and you're certainly pardoned if you don't know it because there ain't much to it. <laughs> the Civil War story out here is pretty thin pickings. Uh, basically, the Confederates wanted to get to the Santa Fe Trail. And they eventually wanted to get to California Gold. Well, that didn't work very well. Uh, basically, in a nutshell, they won the tactical victories, but they lost the strategic war out there. They won two small battles, battles, Val Verde, 1862, and Glorietta, but then they abandoned New Mexico in 1862, and we'll talk about that in a second. Now, who's the, pat, the bishop out here? This is the Santa Fe Diocese, an old historic diocese led by a legendary priest. You see him there, Jean LeMay, Jean-Baptiste LeMay, a Frenchman. First bishop of Santa Fe, came in 1851. He is the subject, by the way, of a fascinating award-winning book uh, by a woman named Willa Cather <coughs> in 1927 called Death Comes to the Archbishop. It's a very thinly disguised biography of LeMay's life. Fascinating gentleman, don't have time to talk about. But what a job this guy had. Let me give you some numbers. Look at the diocese. That's all of New Mexico, all of Arizona, and part of, of Nevada there. You got 24 churches. 25 stations, 68 chapels, 75,000 Mexican Catholics, 85,000 Indians, and 29 priests for that whole territory. But yet three of them are chaplains to the Union Army. Uh, no small accomplishment. Let me tell you about them real quickly. One is a Spaniard, Damasio Taladrid, served with the 1st New Mexico Cavalry and Troops. He is a native of Madrid. Uh, before he left Spain, he was in the seminary, but he got the itch to fight. So he left the seminary to fight in the Spanish army. Well, that worked real good until he got injured and captured. And suddenly he had a change of mind, <laughs> and he went back to the seminary, uh, became a priest, and he studied uh, there, came back to New Mexico in 1854. He met the two men who were putting together the New Mexico troops in 1861. One of them is a name you might have heard before, Christopher Carson, better known as Kit Carson, was putting the New Mexico troops together. And he and Taladrid hit it off. He said, this is the kind of guy we need because the troops were basically Mexican troops and they were illiterate. And they were wild breeds. And Taladrid was a Spanish priest who could keep them in line. He loved them and he did a good job. He did a real good job until Kit Carson got transferred. The next guy came in, didn't care for this guy so much. And so he ran into trouble for drinking and playing a Mexican card game called Monte. And so they brought him up on charges for these two things, but he was so popular that they couldn't let him go. Well, later on, the army tried to get him to sign a temperance pledge. Now just stop and think. You're trying to get a Catholic priest to sign a temperance pledge. Trust me, that ain't gonna go easy. I love his response. He said, I'm not gonna do it because I might play Monte occasionally, 
but I've never been drunk, and I'm as patriotic as anybody. I don't know about you, but that's my kind of priest. I love that guy. He eventually left two years later because of ill health. The other gentleman, Joseph Fialan, barely mentioned he was an informal chaplain, a post-chaplain at a base that was only there about uh, three or four years. But the next man I have to spend some time telling you about, uh, the most amazing priest I've known, flip the slide, Steve, Alexander Grezelikowski, a.k.a. Padre Polacco. Now, the fascinating thing about Padre Polacco, he was definitely a chaplain. I don't know if he was a priest. <laughs> That's the fascinating thing. He definitely was not after the war. Came from Poland, brilliant man. He immigrated in 1847. Bishop LeMay recruited him to bring him over. He served in Ohio for a while, served in New Mexico in 1862. He joined New Mexico Volunteers. He spoke five or six languages. Very educated, urbane man. He comes into the picture at the Battle of Glorietta Pass, which was March 1862. What had happened is the South had already won the Battle of Val Verde. They moved up the Santa Fe Trail to Glorietta, and they were attacking the Union force at Glorietta, and they were succeeding. But in that battle, a small Union raiding force broke away and got behind the Confederate Army and destroyed their entire supply train. 80 wagons, all the horses, all the mules, destroyed them all. Here's where Grezlikowski comes in. Look at the terrain, the bottom middle picture. See that terrain? That's Glorietta Pass. And it was pitch black. And the troops had to get back, otherwise they'd be, the Union force would be pitifully small. Grezlikowski knew the trails by heart. He personally led them all the way back, all night long, through treacherous terrain, back to the uh, Union Army and the Confederates, then had to withdraw from New Mexico territory. So Grezlikowski, I don't know if he's a priest at the time of the Civil War, but he left shortly thereafter, ended up getting married, moved, moved to a little town called Puerto del Luna. This guy is fascinating. He had the only big store in the area, and one day a uh, guy wandered in the store, a young guy, young kid, named Billy, Billy the Kid. <laughs> he became great friends with Padre Polacco. And they all called him Padre Polacco, even though he wasn't a priest by that time. And when uh, Pat Garrett captured him, the legend has that Billy the Kid's last Christmas dinner was at Padre Polacco's Porta de Luna store before he eventually wound up getting killed, of course. Fascinating gentleman, became politically active, became a judge, a postmaster, a rancher, ended up dying in 1896 when he got thrown off of his wagon. So who said priests are boring, huh? Fascinating <laughs> gentleman. Okay, let's switch to another theater. That was the New Mexico theater. Let's switch to another Trans-Mississippi theater. Mississippi, Natchez, Mississippi, and Bishop William Elder. Uh, this whole diocese, this whole scene comes into play, as I'm sure you all know, with the Battle of Shiloh. Shiloh, of course, was not in Mississippi, but guess which was just south of Mississippi was Corinth. You can see it on the map there. You see how close Corinth, see the entrenchments around Corinth there? and how close it was to Shiloh. Uh, this is the Diocese of Natchez. It's under the leadership of this great gentleman, William Elder. And this diocese teaches us a fascinating little lesson about uh, Catholic faith outside of major cities, uh, the European connection. Um, bishops in America are desperate for priests. They, 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 they don't have native priests in America. So where do they go? They go to Europe. An elder made several trips to Europe to recruit priests to come to his diocese. And many French priests responded. Why? Because the French Revolution had just happened. And if you know anything about the French Revolution, priests were pretty high on the list of people getting killed. So a lot of French priests came to Mississippi and very, made a very hard transition. So all of these guys come into play April 1862. Shiloh is fought, 6th and 7th April, 1862. Where do the Confederate soldiers go after Shiloh? They retreat to Corinth. Now you're in Bishop Elder's diocese. You're in the Natchez, Mississippi. By the way, Natchez covered the whole state of Mississippi in those days. So they're in the diocese here. Corinth was under a state of siege for about a month, from April till May, till the Confederate decided they couldn't hold it. Living conditions in Corinth were horrible. Food was horrible. Disease was rampant. 
water supply was bad, soldiers were dying left and right, and here is where the Catholic priest really shone. Bishop Eller said, we've got to come in and we've got to move, we've got to do something. The diocese covered the whole state, but he put out a command, he says, well, I need priests. He got a tremendous response. Two bishops, Elder himself went to Corinth and worked. The Bishop of Mobile came and worked. Nine priests came and worked. Two orders of nuns came and worked in Corinth with all these Confederate troops. Now I'm going to rip off a few names here, but I want you to notice something. Note the death rate when these guys died when I tell you their stories. Four of these five priests died during the Civil War because of disease. The 1878 yellow fever epidemic, if you know anything about the South, yellow fever was a horrible epidemic. It killed six of Bishop Elder's priests in one year in 1878. Let me rip through some of these names here. Julien Gallou, Frenchman, informal chaplain, three Confederate units. He worked in the hospitals after Corinth. He actually had the yellow fever once in 1853, but he recovered, but he died of consumption, February 1863. Gisele and Bohem. Great story, a Belgian. He was recruited to work in the United States, ordained in Kentucky, traveled all around the country, worked with the Indians for a while, worked in Detroit for a while, wound up in the South uh, when he was asked by Bishop Elder to chaplain this regiment called the 13th Mississippi. May ring a bell to you. Commander was a man named Barksdale. William Barksdale had 350 Catholics in Barksdale's regiment. 20 were from uh, Boehm's Parish. So he accompanied the regiment all the way out to the East Coast and fought in the Army of Northern Virginia under Stonewall Jackson. But he was already 59 years old. He did not hold up well under the stress. He died of a stroke on the day that Lee won his battle at Gaines Mill. Francis Pont, another Frenchman, wore a lot of hats during the war, was wounded briefly. He died of the yellow fever, 1867. Jean-Baptiste Moton, fascinating gentleman, another Frenchman, was a post chaplain working on the railroad for a while. Uh, interesting gentleman, he was a trained architect in Europe. And he came to the South and built amazing churches. He built Catholic churches in four towns, built the convent in Vicksburg, partially built the church in Vicksburg. His church in Columbia, Mississippi is standing to this day as a national monument in Mississippi right now, an amazing gentleman. Um, he worked in military hospitals. Um, I have to tell you, his English was bad, but his sense of humor was fantastic. You mind if I tell you a story about him? Catch this story. Once a lady insisted on Moton kissing her baby. No, 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 go away, he said. I kiss no one but the bishop and my horse. <laughs> Once in Corinth, a lawyer wanted to have a talk with him. But the father said, no, no, I've got no time to stop. He says, but I want to join the church, the lawyer said. Moton said, well, we've got so much bad stock on hand now, I can't take any more in. See you later. <laughs> so, so fascinating gentleman. He uh, died in that uh, 1878 yellow fever epidemic with five other priests. Uh, next slide. Two more guys before we close out of this diocese here. Uh, two priests worth mentioning. The guy on the right did not die of plague. He had died of yellow fever. He went on to a little bit of fame. Actually, after the war, Francis LeRay, another French-born guy, uh, traveled by horse. He was pastor at Vicksburg during the war. Uh, but he was actually not there during the siege. He uh, wisely chose to get out of the city, but he came back to rebuild it and uh, actually fought a cholera epidemic after that as well. What happened to him? He became a bishop. He became a bishop of Natchitoches, uh, Texas, and then he went on to New Orleans, uh, to be a bishop as well. The other gentleman uh, on the left, uh, Francis Turgis, I put him up there because I found a marvelous quote about Turgis at Shiloh. Turgis and two other priests about the work they did at Shiloh. Let me read you this anecdote about Father Isidore Turgis, yet another Frenchman, from, he was from New Orleans. Moving about the wounded at the hospital, this man noticed a frail, coarsely clad man in a black cassock. His name was Father Isidore Francois Turgis. There were almost 20,000 Catholics at Shiloh. Father Turgis, along with Father Francis Pont, just mentioned him, Anthony de Chignon, Jesuit, and Francis Bertard were the only priests there. Turgis gave absolution for 18 hours nonstop during the battle. He was with the men of his battalion, 
During the firing, administering last rites, helping the wounded, he narrowly escaped death while aiding a mortally wounded Yankee officer. He was carrying the wounded Yankee off the field when grape shot passed through the man's body and killed him in the priest's arms. This little French priest spent the first week after the battle in Corinth ministering to the men of the 4th, 13th, 17th, 18th, and 24th Louisiana. So, we've honored a uh, forgotten couple forgotten theaters of the war. We honored some forgotten priests. Uh, let's turn now to the largest group of Catholics in the country at that time with the most chaplains serving them. Who were they? Irish. Irish. Kick it over to the fighting Irish. Um, no other ethnic group is so closely identified with the Civil War and Catholics than Irish, are they? Greatest number of immigrants coming in the country of the Civil War? Irish. A tremendous political unity. They were nearly all Democrats. And tremendous Catholic unity, because nearly everyone was Catholic. Ireland at the time was 85% Catholic, so you could pretty much guarantee um, that most of the Irish were Catholics. They faced intense prejudice, intense hatred. You've seen the, the poster down in the lower right-hand corner before, haven't you? No Irish need apply. So a lot of prejudice against Irish. Number of political cartoons about the Pope taking over the church. Uh, Irish immigrants, about 150,000 joined the Union Army. About 20,000 joined the Confederate Army. The estimate, best guess, about 200,000 immigrants. That's not talking native-born Irish. That's just pure immigrants joined the Confederacy and the Union armies all together. Uh, powerful, powerful influence. And Thomas Marr and some of the bishops were strongly active. Next slide there, Steve. The, the Irish have some of the most distinctive regiments and companies, colors, flags, anywhere in the army. Um, in the north, the two big cities that had the Irish were, the Boston, were Boston and New York. Um, New York actually supplied about one-third of all the northern Irish soldiers and the bulk of the official Irish regiments. Two most famous Irishmen in America. You know who they were? Michael Corcoran, Thomas Pratt Francis Marr. Why are they important? Well, Marr formed the Irish Brigade. That famous brigade that came out of New York City, all Irishmen, 69th New York, 63rd, 88th New York, 28th Massachusetts, 160th Pennsylvania. Uh, Marr was very successful because Bishop John Hughes was really a big supporter. They got from the pulpit and they said, you guys need to get out and sign up for the Irish Brigade. Uh, Thomas Corcoran, and of course, they came up with a unique flag. You've all seen the Irish Brigade flag, haven't you? It's an amazingly colorful flag, emerald green flag golden harp in the center, celebrating the Irish heritage. The phrase, you can't see it on here, is a Gaelic phrase meaning clear the way. Clear the way, and you see that flag in a lot of different stories. Corcoran had been uh, previously with the 69th Militia, New York Militia, got captured at Bull Run, but when he came back, he was on fire, he said, I'm gonna form my own regiment. He forms four additional Irish regiments called the Corcoran Legion. So that was the north. The south, had about 20,000 Irish immigrants, as I said, but only one was really designated an Irish brigade, and that was the 10th Tennessee, raised from pretty heavily Irish Nashville, in the counties around Nashville. I'm not gonna go through the regiments, but you can see the list, the breakdown. Um, the Union, of course, was the Irish brigade, had eight chaplains in its time. Corcoran's Legion was there. You can see a number of other ones that from the Union. From the south, by the way, Chicago had two uh, Irish regiments, the 23rd Illinois and the 90th Irish Legion. Both of them had chaplains as well. Confederates had uh, Irish soldiers, but they weren't formed in large groups. They were more in companies because uh, the Confederates didn't see a value of putting all the Irishmen in one place. They split them up in different companies. So you see a lot of different companies here. Um, in ten Tennessee had a couple units. Louisiana had the most. Louisiana had the most Catholics, so it had the most regiments. And because of that, it had the most chaplains. 26 uh, official uh, Confederate chaplains. 13 were Irish serving the Irish brigades. That's how many impacted the Irish. Um, I'm not gonna go through the whole list because it's long. I thought it was kind of interesting for you to see it. But I would point this one out, uh, an interesting statistic. Have you ever heard the stories about the Irish facing the Irish in the Civil War? 
there's at least three instances that I ran across where the Irish faced the Irish. And the most famous one is in that movie that I don't particularly care for. I don't know what you think of it, Gods and Generals. I love Gettysburg. I'm not a big fan of Gods and Generals. Great scene in there where the 24th Georgia, which, fa which is Cobb's Brigade, faced the Irish Brigade right at Fredericksburg. Another one was, this one you ought to remember, uh, 15th Alabama was at a little place called Gettysburg. And they decided to go flank the movement and come up on a little hill called Little Round Top where they ran into a group called 20th Maine. Irish versus Irish. Ran fought into that one too. And then Lassie, 8th Alabama uh, was also at Frazier's Farm. So the Irish heavily influenced in the war. Let's uh, flip gears now. I've covered some larger ones. Let's talk about some of the characters. There were some great characters. Flip the slide here, Steve. Some great characters. Uh, don't have time to go into them all. Mettinger, Gustav Mettinger. God, he wanted to be a chaplain. Oh, he loved it. Wanted to be a chaplain. Only one problem, he couldn't speak English. <laughs> so they assigned him to a regiment. His English was so bad he didn't last more than three or four months. All he could do was say mass in Latin. After that was Paul Gillen. I mentioned Gillen already because Gillen drove that crazy horse buggy around until Grant got tired of him and said, get rid of it and go back. He ended up working for Corcoran. And then I already mentioned Joseph Bixio, fascinating guy. But Jeremiah Tracy, I've got to talk about Tracy, fascinating gentleman, Irishman, the only chaplain to be an official chaplain for both sides. I'll tell you how he did it. He, he was an official chaplain in the Confederates and in the Union. Fascinating gentleman, actually born in Ireland, studied in Chicago, worked in Dubuque, Iowa, then in Iowa, Nebraska with the Indians. He got sick, he moved to Mobile, Alabama, to Huntsville. And when he got to Huntsville, they were organizing the troops. So he volunteered to serve as a chaplain for the troops coming out of Huntsville, Alabama, especially as they're getting the hospital together. They were putting together two forts at Mobile Bay. He volunteered to be chaplain at Mobile Bay. Well, while he was getting supplies for the hospital and getting the forts together, which his bishop supported, he was traveling and he got captured by the Union, by General uh, Buell. So they let him stay with him for a while, but they wouldn't let him go. They said, I'll tell you what, you can work with our captured Confederate prisoners, which he did for a while, then he began working for Union. Eventually they let him go, and he started trying to go back to Huntsville, except they don't want him back in Huntsville because he'd been working in the Union Army. So he started traveling again, and he got captured again by the Union Army, except this time the Union Army had a new commander, and he happened to be the most pronounced Catholic commander in the entire Union Army, William Rosecrans. Rosecrans said, hey, I found me a Catholic priest, and he didn't want to let him go. So he held on to him, and he said, I'm not letting you go, because he was about ready to attack Ayuka. So he said, I'm not letting you go across the southern line, stay with me. So he stayed with them, and eventually he says, why don't you work here? i got just as many soldiers here. So he made him chaplain of the whole 14th Corps. And he became chaplain of that and the 4th U.S. Cavalry. Uh, again, could tell many stories on Tracy, just an amazing guy. He, too, gave a general absolution. Uh, another reason I like Tracy, he carried two canteens with him wherever he went. Water was in one, and the other one was not. <laughs> Whiskey. Carried whiskey and he carried water in two canteens wherever he went. Tough old guy, uh, great story. Can I tell you one story here? We're getting a little long, but I want to tell this story here about Tracy. A Union deserter, they captured him. Uh, he was fighting for the Confederacy, they sentenced him to death. He said, I don't want to talk to anybody. Just leave me alone. He said, if I was going to talk to him, I'd talk to that crazy old man, Tracy. He's the damnedest sensible one of all of them. So they sent for Tracy. After first denying he wanted to see him, the guy spent the whole night in Tracy's tent. And he's crying and weeping so loudly that the guard has to go in and check on him. After basic instructions, Tracy baptizes him. The next morning, as he goes to his execution, he's apologizing to everybody all around him. The guy going with him is swearing up a storm. But he's apologizing to everybody. As he knelt down, he says, please pray for me. He says, just then I'm going to go meet a just God who I've often outraged. 